If I Were in Charge of Christmas, based on a book by Helen Buckley. If I were in charge of Christmas, well, things would have been very different. If I were in charge of Christmas, hmm, let's see. The king would have been laid in a Moses basket. No. A grow bag? No. Then at least a travel cot? No. King Jesus was laid in a manger, an animal food box, a small and unimportant food box. If I were in charge of the first Christmas, well, things would have been very different. But, Jesus being born is too important. God's Son coming into the world is too precious. God was in charge of the first Christmas, just as he said he would. He did it just right. He gave us exactly what we need. Long, long, long ago, God made his people a promise. He promised to send his forever king. A king who rescues. God was in charge of the first Christmas, just as he said he would. He did it just right. He gave us exactly what we need. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and ever acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. I couldn't explain to you how an internal combustion engine works. I can tell you why it's called an internal combustion engine. It's because the combustion happens internally. Actually, I couldn't tell you how photosynthesis works either. There's no way I could explain that to you. And I can't explain how putting the right amounts of sugar and flour and butter and eggs together turns into a cake. And I'm afraid I can't really explain to you how salvation happened either. In the Bible, there are lots of pictures of what it's like, and that's what I'm going to explore with you today. But I do know why we needed a savior. I do know why we needed an eternal king, a king with no beginning and no end, a king who loves and cares for us, and a king who rescues. It's because we got it stupidly wrong in the beginning. In the beginning, people were made in the image of God. And they enjoyed a wonderful relationship with him. If you look back at the Genesis story, God is right there, face to face with his people. They walk in the garden in the cool of the evening. Isn't that a beautiful picture? But then they were sold a lie and they chose to believe the father of all lies above God. They chose to believe the one who deceives above the one who is righteousness and truth and beauty and love. They were told that they could be more like God if they ignored what he said. The implication was that God was keeping something back from them, something that they ought to have. They had their rights and they chose to believe that. And then suffered the consequences because that drew a veil between them and God. It distanced them from him. Not only that, it robbed them of eternal life, life in all its fullness with him. And so they ended up going down the wrong road, 
trapped and tangled in sin and deceit, stumbling about in the dark, out of touch with God, and struggling to find a way back to what they had given away. They didn't lose it. They gave it away. We didn't lose it. We gave it away when we chose to believe the father of all lies. And all through the Old Testament, we have glimpses of people searching again to get back and of God talking to them about what he was going to do. Everything in the Old Testament points to the Savior who comes in the new. And all the way through, we have pictures of what this salvation is. Because if I could really understand it, it would mean that I really understood God. And if I really understood God, he wouldn't be worth worshipping, would he? I have to live with the mystery. And so I do. When I was a child, I was brought up in the Anglican church and we sang a lot of traditional hymns. And the one that I want to look at at the moment is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like me his praise should sing. And I think that we can use those four words, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, to see what this salvation that Jesus came to give us looks like. We're ransomed. We're ransomed in order to be given a freedom. We're ransomed out of dark into the light. Isaiah says, the people who walked in a darkness have seen a great light, and those who live in a dark land, on them the light will shine. I'm sure you've remembered seeing pictures, uh, was it in Chile where they had that mine disaster? And they brought those men out, and they were blinking in the sunlight. They had been in the dark. They had been confused. They had been frightened. They had been terrified. They had been left, felt abandoned. And now they're brought out into the light. And Isaiah says, that's just what it's going to be like when the Savior comes. We'll come out of stumbling about in the dark. And we'll see the light that he has for us. We'll see where we're supposed to be going. We'll see how we're supposed to be. We'll see what it is to be received by the king who rescues. And we'll come out of captivity into freedom. The Jewish nation knew all about being in captivity and being slaves. It happened when they were enslaved in Egypt. And they looked back every year to that, that rescue, that time of liberation. Because while they were slaves in Egypt, they weren't free to be the people they were meant to be. They were compelled to do things they didn't want to do. They were trapped and helpless. And when they came out, then they were free to be the people God wanted them to be. Free to be the light to lighten the Gentiles. Didn't quite work out like that, but that was the plan. But no longer did they have to obey somebody else's rules. They could live by God's rules. And God's rules give freedom. Isaiah again says, For they shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppression. We are ransomed to come out of the darkness into the light, out of captivity into freedom. And how? Because unto us 
a child is born. And to us, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The King who rescues came to redeem us. And he came to heal us too. Risen with healing in his wings. There's a beautiful line out of a carol that is one of my favorites. And healing is in all kinds of ways. We can be healed from past hurts. We can be healed from the wounds that we inflict on ourselves by our anxiety and our worry. We can be healed physically. All of that is promised. Because as those of us who are getting older well know, we function much better when we're well than we function when we're not. And God wants to bring us to that place of healing so that we can do what he's asked us to do and be who he's asked us to be. Isaiah again reminds us that this healing is through Jesus. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And all of us need that healing all the time. We need that balm from Gilead that will calm troubled spirits and troubled souls. We may need healing in body. And if that's you today, then pray. Pray with someone for that. Heal me, O Lord, says Jer Jeremiah, and I shall be healed. Save me, for you are my praise. Ransomed, healed, restored. Restored back into that relationship which we threw away. Restored to be the children of God. Restored to be able to approach the throne of God in the same way that those first people walked in the cool of the evening. Hosea says, The numbers of the children of Israel will be like the sands of the sea, which no man can number. And it will come to pass that where it was said, You are not my people, it will be said, You are the children of the living God. The king who rescues came to restore us back into that relationship which we threw away, that we can be called the children of God. But as many as are received, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God even to all who believe on his name. That's his whole name that we're believing on. And if you look through the scriptures, then there's an awful lot of names for God and for Jesus. We believe in a God who heals. We believe in a God who's satisfied. We believe in a God who provides. We believe in a God who is love. The list goes on and on. And as we take those names and say, yes, that's what I believe, we get closer and closer to being the people we are meant to be. Images, little Christs, Christians, the children and heirs of the kingdom. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. We keep getting it wrong, don't we? 
We keep making mistakes, saying things in haste that would have been better left unsaid, not reaching out with words of comfort when they would have lifted someone's head. We've been selfish with our time, selfish with our money perhaps, clinging on to possessions, offering at best lukewarm love and praise and worship where it should have been wholehearted love, exuberant praise and wild worship to the God who loves us, who cares for us, who rescues us. When I was, as I said, younger, I was an Anglican. And in the communion service, they have the comfortable words. Hear what comfortable words our Lord Jesus Christ said to all who truly turn to him. And one of them is this from 1 John. If anyone should sin, which should read when everyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. The king with no beginning and no end. The king who loves and cares for us so much that he cannot leave us where we are but wants to come in and rescue us. He offers us all that and more. He offers us to, to bring us out of darkness into light, out of captivity into a freedom and a life that we cannot imagine because he offers us life in all its fullness. Not just now, we're already in eternity. Eternity isn't something that's going to happen after we're dead. We're standing in eternity now. We have that life that's going to go on now. My parents died physically, but I know that they are living on because they were in that eternal life, and I'm in that eternal life too, and so are you and all who call on his name. I can be healed. Some things have already been healed. If you'd known me as a teenager, you would have known that I was easily upset, that I was very, very quick with sarcastic comments, which were really clever and horribly hurtful. I still do it, but in a more loving way, I hope. I was less than generous with my time. And nobody could have called me gracious or full of grace. Some things are an ongoing healing, and I'm standing in that. But I know that I am restored, that I am now a child of God. That I have that loving relationship with a king who loves and cares for me, the king who has rescued me. And daily, I know that I'm forgiven. I can't explain to you how the internal combustion engine works, but I can use it to get from where I am to where I want to go in my nice little car that I love. And I can't explain how salvation came about, but I know that because it came about, I have the power of the Holy Spirit which will take me from where I am to where I need to be and will power me for the journey. I can't tell you or explain to you how photosynthesis works. But I do know that if I plant a seed in the ground, then 
God, through nature and the laws which he has put into place, will make it grow. And from a seed this big, I'll get a sunflower this big with hundreds of seeds this big on it. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, I can plant seeds, you can plant seeds, we can plant seeds. Here, in our various ministries, and the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the loving salvation of a king who rescues, will make that grow. And I don't know, and I can't explain to you why butter and eggs and flour and sugar make a cake. But I do know that if I put them together with the right ingredients, then I'll get a cake that's fit to eat, mostly. And I do know that we are the ingredients of a cake. We have been put here to work together so that we can reach out and we can say to this community and the communities where we live, oh, taste and see how gracious the Lord is. We're here for a purpose. We are those who have tasted the salvation of God and we're here and our role is to spread that message of a king who has no beginning and no end. A king who loves and cares for every atom of his creation. And who has reached down to rescue us through the birth of a baby. Oh, taste and see how gracious the Lord is. And to him be all the glory. Amen. So as we think about our wonderful king, as we think about the coming of the baby at Christmas, Let's spend some time in prayer. Loving God, we want to praise you for who you are. Praise you, our mighty creator. Praise you who loves us with an everlasting love. We thank you that your love for us was so great. You could not leave us where we were, but sent your son that we might be brought back into relationship with you. Thank you that through him, we are the ransomed. We are the healed. We are the restored. We are the forgiven. In order, we want to take this opportunity to recommit our lives to you. To acknowledge who you are in our lives and what you've done in our lives. To put our hands into your hands and say, Lead me, Lord, where you would have me go. Today is Offering Sunday. And Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us for our family, for 
the provision you've made in our lives for our jobs, for the warmth of friends. And this time we offer back to you all that we have and all that we are. Accept our sacrifice of money and time, our use of talents, and grant that all of it will be used for the furtherance of your kingdom and to the glory of your name. Lord, we know that the world that you created you looked at it and saw that it was good, but it is marred and troubled now. So, Father, we bring to you those places where your light does not yet shine, your love is not evident, your truth is not spoken, and your justice does not prevail. And in the quiet of our hearts, or out loud, we name those places before you now. For Russia. Thank you, God, that you have called us to be your children, heirs to your kingdom. And we join with Christians all around the world as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, boldly proclaiming, Our Father. Two of our congregation have um, set off today, I think, to take um, boxes from this region to Romania. And so just for a moment, let's remember them, Dorothy and Elizabeth. Heavenly Father, we pray for Dorothy and Elizabeth as they set out on this mission with love in a box. We pray that they would have safe travel hassle-free travel, that you would take them to the places that you want them to be, and that they can speak to the people you'd have them speak to. And we pray for all those families who are relieve boxes, receive boxes. May they know your love and your joy. May they know that they are remembered and cared about. 
May they know something of the king who loves and cares, the king who loves to rescue.